Before we jump in, a note on our content. This is created for adult audiences only. We advise listener discretion. We have discussions about sexual violence against women. We use bad swear words. We talk openly about women's autonomy. And you might just hear some opinions that don't jive with your own. I can tell you, as a Desi American, when I visit my ancestral home, I feel like a perfect tourist. Looking at me, I fit right in, but inside my head, I'm snapping photos of everyday life, which may seem mundane to everyone around me, but from my eyes, they look unexpected, beautiful. I'm asking questions, trying to figure out the rhythm of life. Can I smile at the guy behind the cash register when he serves me? Where are the women? Why are there hardly any women on the streets, ever? Hello, hello. This is Her Ganjo Won't Smudge. I'm Shauna. Join me as I talk to Desi women who are imagining a better, fairer world, free of all those unwritten social rules that tell us just how to be a good Desi woman. Today, my guest is Saba Banu Malik. She's a founding member of Aurat Naak, a Pakistani comedians collective. She's also a radio jockey based in Karachi and a social media activist who speaks out against body shaming, toxic rishta culture. Oh, and she's also a feminist. I reached out to Saba for all these reasons, but also because she's a Pakistani American who moved to Pakistan as an adult. I figured she might have some really interesting insights, the kinds that a foreigner, non-foreigner might notice about what life is like for women in Pakistan. And I have to say, I got totally lucky. Saba, thanks so much for joining me today. I'm excited. So you're a radio jockey on Full Disclosure, a radio show on City FM 89 in Pakistan, which is probably one of the most popular urban radio channels in Pakistan. And your show is the only and therefore the best hip hop (laughs) radio show in Pakistan. Yes, we can say that. (laughs) We can say that much, right? Yeah. I wish I knew the exact numbers, but like, Alhamdulillah, I'm about to go into my fourth year with the show in just two weeks. Amazing. It's the best job. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. And you're part of uh, Aurat Naak. As a comedian, you're part of this inclusive community of comedians that seeks to empower women. Yes, I'm one of the founding members of the Islamabad chapter. Unfortunately, because of COVID and stuff, things like, you know, slowed down. We still did a few shows, but yeah, we are feminist comedy collective that, you know, not just women, but non cisgendered male voices, essentially, we are trying to amplify and, you know, shine a light on. You are living in Pakistan now, but did you always want to live in Pakistan? No, like this was fully never in my plan in life and nor was it in my family's plan. It was just circumstances, which, you know, it's a wider story, but unless I ask them permission, I don't know how much I can really tell. So I'll just tell my part of it is after my parents relocated and I was sort of an adult (laughs) and I had to be an adult on my own, I won't lie, it really wasn't going too well. And then in 2013, my sister and I joined our parents and it was supposed to be very short. We were like, we'll just go for six months, like figure out what we want to do and then come back to the States. But ironically, at the six month mark, I got a job at a fashion and lifestyle magazine, which was at that point, like what all I wanted was to work in fashion. But in 2013, a fat brown woman was not like number one in America in terms of like fashion, pop culture, nothing. Of course, it's very much changed now. Still not perfect. Obviously, a long way to go. And so because of that, I decided to stay. And now I've been here eight years. But I had lived here when 2001 to 2003, I was in seventh and eighth grade. My parents kind of did like a little exchange program where they sent us here to go to school for two years. Mm-hmm. We're all in therapy because of it now. Um, and I, uh, the contrast of 
2003 Pakistan versus 2013 Pakistan was incredibly jarring. Um, the kind of shifts that I saw in the country and stuff and coming here and as an adult in your mid 20s is quite a move. So I want to ask you about that because, you know, I wonder if you felt a little bit like an imposter, like you look Pakistani, but you couldn't really, you know, kind of fully understand the way that Pakistanis looked at their own society and kind of were willing to put up with things. Well, I'm eight years into this living here and calling this place my home, and I still don't feel Pakistani enough, to be honest with you. And I've had actually this conversation with a lot of American Pakistanis, Canadian Pakistanis, British Pakistanis, is when you don't grow up here and, you know, language and cultural reference points and honestly, community is not something you were a part of really young. There are, Mm -hmm. I do feel that there is a gap at times in connection with people. Now, some people have like, killed it. And it's really made no difference. And they've really assimilated well. But there are still some things where like, things that are kind of acceptable here that people kind of brush over, whether it's like, casual racism or casual misogyny and stuff. Like, I feel like those are things that if you're like me in East Coast, extremely liberal state is where I grew up and mm-hmm. stuff like it continues to be jarring to me till now. Sometimes when I hear these things and I feel like that can sometimes get in the way of connection. Now, it's not all the time. I mean, I have friends and incredible people and like Pakistanis are much more progressive than the world wants to paint them as a little lot of senses. But I would say there is a bit of that is like you're not Pakistani enough for a Mm -hmm. lot of things. And then simultaneously, when you grow up in the West, I mean, you're never going to be American. Like I don't (laughs) you can be centuries in America, but as long as you aren't white, you are not American. Even black Americans don't get to be American. And mm-hmm. so uh, like Pakistani Americans, I think we have a couple of centuries to go before they're like, Acha, fine. <laughs> we'll allow it. So. Fine. Okay, finally, we will accept you. Yeah. So you did this great Vice documentary. It's a Vice short documentary film on Pakistani female comedians. It's called Patriarchy Punchlines in Pakistan. I saw it on YouTube. And in it, you said you don't post your own comedy material online because of the threats. Yeah. So I want to kind of just jump in and ask you, you know, what threats do female comedians face? Oh, so it goes the gambit, but um, I won't take her name right now just because like, for whatever reason, I feel like her life has calmed down. So I don't need to amplify. But um, one comedian set went viral once where she made comment like funny jokes about her own ethnic background. Because you know, Pakistanis are not just one thing. (laughs) There's many different kinds of us. And those like her thing went viral and just rape threats, death threats, um, running her out of the country. I mean, rape and death are the two most prominent ones and like threats of violence, because what is the one thing everyone will threaten against a woman is rape because they're just fucking disgusting. And then violence, honestly, and like doxing and like coming for you. And this is a kind of constant here where like, look, so for example, I don't put my videos of comedy on the internet, or I haven't yet, like I might change my mind, because truthfully, I'm not an R rated comedian, like I, my parents come to my shows. And like, I'm okay with them hearing what I have to say, for the most part, I also force them to look at my Twitter. So but meanwhile, I'll tweet like, whatever the fuck I want to say. But there's something about it not being tied to like a video of me and my own face saying it, which gives me like a, I don't know, like a bit of cushion. But I, in general, as a woman online, I think a lot about what I'm saying and like what boundaries I'm pushing. But when it comes to like comedy and like joking about like sex or dating, or because a lot of my jokes have to do with dating, Dating still here is like equivalent to doing porn, right? Right. It's totally taboo. I mean, you don't talk about it. Exactly. And like, I'm someone who will like tweet about her period, like frequently because newsflash, it happens every month. (laughs) I have new material every three to four weeks. And the kind of responses I get from men 
online is me talking. I could literally be talking about the most crippling um, period pain, menstruation pain you can have, and they view it as something sexual. Just referring to women's health, even tweeting about breast cancer is immediately linked with sex because women's and their bodies are so heavily policed, but also our voices. Like mm-hmm. us just talking out loud, laughing out loud, is seen as like enticement. Like in public, like at a restaurant? Yes, yes. In my opinion, absolutely. I think being so like to think of putting comedy out there. And, you know, comedy is subjective, but I think um, hating women is not. (laughs) It's quite a common thing. It's not. Yeah. So it's the confidence you think that kind of is what gets these guys, you know, really pissed off and writing terrible things on social media pages more so than even the fact that a joke was maybe misinterpreted. I think that when you already carry a level of bias against a person for whatever reason. I mean, for me, it could be I'm fat, I'm a woman, I'm American, I'm privileged. Like there's a number of reasons that if you already wanted to dislike a person, they exist. So then when we say something and we see it with a smile and confidently, all it's going to do is piss that person off who already dislikes you or already wants to find a reason to hate you. Yeah, and to control Exactly. 100%. I mean, women talking is enough to really bother people. So (laughs) yeah, you should just stay quiet all the time. All the time. So you talk about many aspects of being a woman. Why is it important for you to talk about the body shaming? Um, why is it important? So when I first got into this space, I guess, of like talking about bodies. Now, the thing is, I'm a fat woman. So my whole life, my body has been somewhat of the subject matter when it comes to me. And however, it's not in the traditional sense. I think when I got into this space and I got the opportunity to talk to so many men and women across Pakistan about their bodies, I understood again that a piece of my privilege was that I was not indoctrinated to believe that I was less than because I was more than, (laughs) you know, because I had bigger body or the way I looked. And that was very lucky for me, because that's really not the case in the majority. And when I first kind of popped off on the internet, I basically posted a picture of me in a sari and sleeveless with my stomach showing no agenda that I'm gonna show the world a fat lady can be happy. But that is kind of how it was taken is like, I guess I didn't understand that it would even have impact. Like I was just looking to make my friends call me hot, you know, but I got so many messages from men and women on it. I was really surprised about the men, obviously majority women who it meant something to them. And I realized that uh, once again, just like feminism, just like female autonomy or, you know, lending whatever platform I have to other minority groups and stuff, it mattered to me to talk about body shaming because it is so fucking cruel what we do to people and how we break them down and how we literally stop them from succeeding just because they don't look a certain way. Honestly, I was kind of thrust into that role just because of what I looked like. But I like talking about it. I like educating people about it. And now I'm on TikTok where, you know, men call me fat day in, day out. And like, I have fun with my responses. And I think one of the ways that I've done it a little differently, and I understood this over time. Initially, I was trying to educate the scumbags who talk shit. But now what I try to do or what I am doing is I just talk to the people that are being shitted on. And I'm like, yo, we don't have to respect scumbags who talk about our bodies. And I bring Mm -hmm. humor into it. And I hope by making people understand that we are more than our bodies. We are more than what people think and that we shouldn't have to fucking care, honestly. So when was it that you became a feminist? I mean, you call yourself a feminist. When did that happen for you? Was it in Pakistan? I believe yes. So I did not have the terminology for it, but my entire life, I knew that this was some bullshit. You know what I'm saying? Like I knew there was some bullshit afoot because I grew up in a very large Pakistani community. And although in my household, I mean, my memory is shot. That's, I don't know, trauma deletes a lot of things, but the 
concept of like shabi 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 wasn't there and i think i was lucky just to have the combination of parents that i did that being a girl did not play a huge role in debilitating me, like stopping me from doing things and it sounds dumb to say it in hindsight but i fully finally understood how privileged and lucky truly lucky i was that i was just born in the house i was born in with the mentalities that existed there because i was so floored like truly dumbfounded that education for girls could be viewed as scandalous or taboo that a girl going to work could be viewed as scandalous or taboo i mean all female autonomy here was seen as like just mistrusted like women were literally just viewed from as with suspicion as soon as they were born and when i faced this for what i believe is the first time in my life honestly first you feel like such a fucking idiot because it just was so far away i mean we have our different opinions of what pakistan is and seeing this myself for the first time it just ignited me they it, it literally changed my whole life it changed the way i thought it changed the way that i understood who i am and any platform that i built from then onwards any work i did from then onwards this is the center point of it so you came to pakistan and you got a job and at what point did you start to have that platform how did that happen so initially when i started working in fashion i actually didn't have any public social media accounts because my parents and i were told that agar shaadi karna hai then you can't if you want to get married then you can't have it the irony is all the girls who started with me half of them married with children married for sure and they all had public accounts i always like to bring this up to my family <laughs> if your parents are listening yeah oh but believe- trust me every i like to literally send them a list i'm joking i'm very lucky <laughs> but when i started transitioning into news and i at that time i had started writing like columns and satire and stuff i felt like okay i need to have a public presence and when i started transitioning into news that is when i went very all out on twitter and on instagram as well and i honestly it wasn't like i planned it but this is just how i felt so like some of my first like kind of bigger content pieces was kind of ranting and raving on feminism and on how women are treated and autonomy and you know things like that and i want to say this was end 2017 early 2018 so it's not been that long since i've been kind of wild <laughs> um on the internet but that was when it really popped off if i'm in remember. public yeah in public When I looked at your social media pages, that's one thing that really struck me is like, you know, when you talk about the body shaming, how many women would chime in and, you know, basically say thank you in one way or another or share their own experiences. You also call out this weird rishta culture. Hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? My family witnessed my sister going through this extremely toxic, archaic and just straight up misogynistic practice which more or less women are like cattle that get observed and poked and prodded and like a family decides whether you're worthy or not and the thing is is that my family was like we're not doing this shit anymore like fuck it but for the majority that's not the case and people don't see a problem with it and it all kind of ties in together right feminism autonomy body shaming all these things and rishta culture to me is like the worst of all of it because you basically stop women from being their own people so that they can be married off to someone and they decide what she become i am not against arranged marriage and there is a difference to me between arranged marriage and rishta culture the way i see arranged marriage is like a setup right like if my friend was like hey i know someone mhm why would i i'm not offended at that so if my parents who like me i think are like hey you should meet someone i'm not against it but the rishta culture it starts for girls as soon as they're born because like there's a reason why 9 year old saba me could no longer wear shorts and it's because i need to be marriageable whether my parents even viewed it that way or not you need to be a good girl in the eyes of culture and in the eyes of community 
You've said that when a baby girl is born, you are born a woman. And if you are a Pakistani woman, then you're already at fault. Yes. And you call out the culture, the culture that promotes and protects men's violence. How can a culture enable gender violence? Well, as we've seen in Pakistan and a lot of cultures, the way we enable it is because they act as though the control of women is a part of preserving the culture. And quiet women, controlled, docile, obedient women is true culture and not colorful, powerful women who, if you look at centuries of this part of the world, have built this place and have built the cultures and the languages and the people you see. And like one big thing I would mention is if you look at Pakistan's entertainment industry, our drama culture, for example, they have very much normalized and even justified domestic abuse, marital abuse, um, familial control, parental control, the joint family system, which is cultural and actually not religious, but they you know, misuse that here as well. So I think that our culture... Act- they romanticize it. Yes, 100%. And our culture really romanticizes is a great word because which one of our dramas do really well? And the dramas here that do incredible are, like I say, they kind of make porn of two things. The beaten down, dawn trodden, backed in a corner woman who just wants to be so nice and save everything through being a nice girl. And the man who is just an angry man child who then gets romanticized as a hero. And literally those actors have so much success and stuff. And I know not all actors are their roles. It's just sometimes they end up being that here and you find out that they're pieces of shit in real life too. And so when millions are watching that and they don't see a problem with a girl getting slapped, slap, slap, slap. They don't see a problem with a couple who fucking hate each other somehow having a child on the way. You, When you look at these things is when you start realizing just how normalized the violence and hatred of women is and how it is seen as our culture. So, you know, earlier when you asked me my feminism awakening and I mentioned to you that when I found out that going to school was considered taboo and salacious, the first time I saw that was on multiple dramas where girls trying to go to university and their, even though it was a drama and their families being like, what are you really up to? Meanwhile, if I had not wanted to go to university, my parents would have like drop kicked my ass because like my understanding was education came before everything versus here, your marriage ability being at the highest level surpassed everything for women. That was number fucking one. And that is just gut wrenching. Whether it's about getting married or it's about having a better economy or it's about like making more jobs in the country, whichever way you want to look at it, you need educated women. I mean, educated women are going to turn out better kids. Better kids are going to do better in school. Yeah. They do better in school. They'll get better jobs. Yeah, yeah. Okay, first of all, we have 23 million children who do not go to school. That is insane. That is a fucking country, okay, that does not uh, go to school. But it's not even just that education. It is all around education. It is the education of what does it mean to step outside, walk to a market, buy something? What does it mean to negotiate a salary? What does it mean to talk to the opposite gender and to speak to them with respect and to get respect? And these sort of street smarts and these sort of autonomy making smarts are so discouraged. They are almost absent, literally absent. Let's pause for a second. 23 million children between the ages of 5 and 16 aren't in school in Pakistan. Sabah's right. That is a country, the entire country of Taiwan. 12 million girls aren't in school, and that's also a country, the entire population of Jordan. We know what happens to these girls. They marry early, have kids early, and you get children raising children. And this breeds other problems, too. UNICEF did a study in 2021 and found that in Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh, the younger a woman marries, the more likely she is to think that domestic violence is acceptable. But when you don't even talk to someone 
about what to expect when they leave their home and enter another one's with a man they might not even know. You are setting them up for a life in the best case scenario, maybe it works out, but more often than not, like, where's the autonomy? Where's the consent? Where's the understanding of what's happening? And in Pakistan, people truly believe that marital rape isn't real. Like, and then it cannot be real. It cannot. Yeah. And that is something that kills me. Like, literally, when I think about it, it just breaks my heart because I'm like, how many women are sitting to my right and left? who literally do not have ownership on their bodies. Mm. And when I talk about bodily autonomy or bodily ownership in my own content or the shit I put out there on the internet, the kind of vitriol that I get, especially from men, is insane. Like if you tell a man that his wife can say no to him, they lose their goddamn minds. Does it like, cause it's almost like, and look, I, again, like I'm not, not all men is bullshit, but I will say like what I've learned in my work and actually getting to speak to Pakistanis outside of just who my parents know, a lot of men are pressured into marriage too. A lot of them, mm-hmm. a lot of men, majority of men actually Pakistan, they don't even have sexual education. They don't have education on consent and autonomy or whatever. And it's like, we just send them off <laughs> and we send women off and we're like, okay, whatever your husband says. And like, to your point that what about after the wedding? But it's just as long as my daughter is married and signed up to one man, then I've done my work and she can no longer be my job. Yeah, she can't be a hoe right. now. So everything is fine. We've managed to save her from that. Yeah. So you've spoken at protests in Pakistan. I know you've spoken at Aurat March, but you also speak at rallies that happen when a woman has been murdered. What is that like for you to speak at these events as a Pakistani American who has this different kind of lens that you see things through? Well, I take it as a huge responsibility because I am one of many voices in Pakistan who, well, I still say that I have a level of privilege, but I will acknowledge that I do take risks with my own personal safety as well when I talk about these topics. But there's a lot of us out there and there's a responsibility to speak up and speak the right thing. And it's my honor when I get to speak. I mean, it's incredible that anyone even wants to listen to what I have to say or understand my perspective. And I just think that when you introduce that, you know, you can think about things in different ways, that has a power in itself that like, listen, I'm thinking this way and like, I'm okay. And the world didn't end. And my family dynamics didn't end. And culture didn't come to a complete stop. Because I think you can say, my body, my choice, or whatever. But any time I've gotten to speak or like at anything, or, you know, be asked to speak or be asked to lend my voice, I take it as an extreme responsibility, something I have to take very seriously. I am, again, amongst a privileged group that can say something and then go home and be safe. So, Sabah, I listened to one of the talks you gave after the death of Noor Mukaddam, the murder. You were pissed off. I was, if there's one thing that we blame women for everything that happens to them. They get raped, it's their fault. They get murdered, it's their fault. They get married, it's their fault. They get divorced, it's their fault. They miscarriage, it's their fault. They birth a girl, like everything is our fault. And Noor Mukaddam, you know, she was a human. She was a daughter. Her life was brutally taken. And then the country turned on her in this way. Like every opportunity they get to sort of rake a woman through knives they take. That When they asked me to speak, I think there was for a number of reasons. One, Noor and I share a social class and social overlap. A few words about Noor Mukaddam. 27-year-old Noor was murdered on July 20th, 2021 by a man she knew, Zahir Jafir, the son of a wealthy merchant family. He held her hostage for two days in his upscale house in Islamabad where his house help stopped her from escaping. He decapitated her. And according to the press, he did this because she refused his proposal Her murder resonated with so many urban educated women. She was one of them, the daughter of a former ambassador. 
it just showed yet again that the violence against women doesn't have to do with poverty or lack of education. It's just about how women are viewed. All women are viewed. And if a woman steps out of line, she gets what's coming to her. The sick irony of it all is that just four months before her death, Noor walked in Aurat March, carrying a sign that called out Pakistan's patriarchal social structure. I never met her myself, but I, that group I know, I've been very vocal online about it. And what it felt like in that moment, honestly, was I was angry because so many men from our social segment of society, who I know had scoffed at Orth March, who I know have turned blind eyes at some of the shitty things their friends have done, were standing there. So I got really fucking mad. I was already mad. I mean, I think Noor's death was shattering in a way that no one has yet to really recover from that. And then that day I'm standing there and I'm hearing how, like, I believe at that point it was the 12th or 14th trans woman who had been just gutted, slaughtered and left in the street. And I believe that it, half the year wasn't even up. And then you think about these things and I'm standing up there and I'm talking and all you really fucking hope is that something is big enough for things to change. You've spoken at a few such rallies. Is there something about you and you being American and that ability to tap into this is not right that makes people want to hear you speak in particular? Well, I'm going to say that it's more the privilege, but I can be on this podcast with you and I can say anything, anything I want, honestly. And my parents will have a door open for me to come home. This is alarmingly not the majority. So when I'm someone who's going online and I am literally screaming for Noor or Sara, uh, who was most recently murdered by her husband or, you know, whatever the case may be, and I'm shrieking about it online, they know I'm not afraid to say it in person. And I have that sort of level. And, you know, I don't know how much being American plays into a role. I mean, they know I speak good English. I'm not sure, but... I do think being an American Pakistani is more tied into the fact that there's that privilege and there's that cushion. And I'm not sitting here and saying like I come from some super liberal family or whatever, but I do come from a household where my autonomy and my voice is not policed. But, you know, there have been or at the Zod and like they do incredible work like these marches. They really do, you know. And I would lend my radio show, like I'd have them come and speak on it. I do it every single year, then like come and get people to come. And the one thing I did one year is I led the march. So what that means is, is like I had the drums and I walked a few feet ahead of the main line to push back reporters. Again, I can do that wow. because of my privilege, my size, one thing, my Americanness, because I can scream and shout in English or whatever. And I think that's one of the reasons. And I mean, I would hope, I have to assume at this point, it's because people like what I want to, what I'm saying. And I believe that I'm speak as, as some people might view it as radical, but the very basis of everything that I say about women is that we are fucking human beings. We are worthy of respect and autonomy mm -hmm. and living in dignity and having choice. There is nothing that, nothing that can stop me from fighting for that one thing is that we have choices and we get to make them for our fucking selves. Something that really gets to me about Pakistani quote unquote, you know, culture. I don't think this has actually got anything to do with culture. But Pakistan claims that it respects the women and that, you know, they're held up on this pedestal. But in fact, that's all a bunch of bullshit. Yeah, bullshit. Because, you know, if you see a woman being harassed and if that is, in fact, deeply rooted in your culture, you wouldn't put up with that. And just saying it doesn't make it true. I have to point out, I mean, as a journalist, I had to go and, you know, make videos and I really enjoyed it of interviewing people. 
And I interviewed a man who became very, very famous, literally for like being good looking. And he ended up opening up his own cafes. He was a Jai Wala. I don't know if you know about Jai Wala or whatever. And when he was having the opening of his first restaurant, I mean, this is a poor guy, got spotted on camera, was able to fund his own restaurant or whatever. It's a great story. And when I asked him, oh, is your family coming? He scoffed at me and went, our women don't leave the house. And the reason I'm bringing this up is there was an attitude towards me that entire shoot. And there's an attitude towards me on many shoots where I have to speak to men. Um, I've had men not even look at me or make eye contact with me. And I wonder if I'm in a scenario where I'm a journalist being out there gawked at, leered at, da, 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 no one has ever stepped in, including at times my own cameramen or the people I'm with, because the understanding is like, well, what are you doing here? What did you expect? They don't view you as a good woman. So whatever happens to you is that's what you deserve. Your game. Your game. Because you left the house today. You put on Western clothes. You don't have your face covered. You don't have your hair covered. You have boobs. <laughs> that's literally a reason they'll use. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. You should only be indoors, like a cat, like an animal. Literally. I want to read something that Chezo Malik posted after 400 men sexually assaulted a woman who was out with friends on Independence Day. So Chezo's a Pakistani illustrator and designer and street artist and, and, and. So her post says, when will you be convinced that it's not women leaving the house that's the problem because you rape and kill us in our houses too, but that the problem is that there's no accountability here? How is it that people are questioning why we leave the house and not questioning why when men leave the house every day, women are at risk of violence? And at the end of Shezel's post, it says, quote, words by Sabah Banu Malik echoing our collective sentiments. (laughs) When you were reading it, I was like, wait, did I write that? It sounds like, and now I remember that she had posted it. And I actually remember another amazing activist and lawyer, Lena Ghani, had also um, reposted it. You just brought me back. Literally, we're under so much trauma all the time that I was like, who said that? That sounds right. Yeah. And it was very much reflective of what I've been saying since I started this, is just why and when and at what point did we start hating women so fucking much. When? When did it happen? You made such a valid point that we pretend culture is respecting women, but it's not. It truly isn't. And then, and or maybe it was once upon a time, but somewhere along the line, something happened here where it just all went to shit and it has just grown and the hatred has grown. It's something that always upset me. Like when I was a kid and like the first time I sort of witnessed like boys and girls are different. This is a question I pose to my family as well that, wait, but if you're locking me up because of the way boys behave, why are your boys allowed to leave the house? It never made sense to me. Till this day, it doesn't make sense to me. I've researched you basically because I kept thinking of you as a comedian and a radio jockey and a journalist. And I looked at the material that you'd sent me. And I also started looking at social media to see where your name was coming up the thing that really struck me that you really do seem like one of those voices of Pakistani women. Well, you know, to hear you say that, like, um, honestly, like an emotional thing to hear for me, because I know we'll get called out. So I do want to say this. There are women who put their lives on the line every day in Pakistan. I mean, just you look at Balochistan, you look at minorities, especially like Shia minority, Hazara minority, and the women, actually, even, you know, you go to the North where people are right now battling it out on the borders, like women are forefront. I won't discredit what I do. I am a voice. And I think my experiences in life, for sure, being an American meant going to school was not questioned. It meant going to work was not questioned. It meant driving a car was not questioned. It meant questioning was not questioned, right? Like I, Mm. and again, maybe even just specific to my household, but I was encouraged to be a full person. I was not raised to be shipped off as soon as I got my period or I could be of use to my family or another one. And, you know, when you say like separating patriarchy and culture, it is 
a thing that pains me is like I grew up in a huge Pakistani community and it's a rarity because actually I feel like kids, first generation immigrant kids usually hate their cultures or at least that's the narrative that is, you know, studio. I mean, I love Mindy Kaling, don't get me wrong, but like her show is literally like, I want to be white. <laughs> like I don't, and you know, other things like that. Um, but I loved being Pakistani. I was on like Punjabi dance teams and learning the language and I loved the music and I loved the culture. Again, my version of it, which was, you know, very rosy and bubbly. And when I see what it's become is that we've sucked the color out of it and we've sucked the joy out of it. And we keep rewriting mm -hmm. history that certain things aren't real and like removing ourselves from India or this and that and like color and festival. You know what I mean? And like, that shit fucking breaks my heart. But the worst thing is in history, this is not how we treated women. This is not how we viewed women. So when people like, this is our culture, I'm like, I don't know what the fuck your culture is, but mine isn't hitting women. Mine isn't marital rape. Mine isn't that a girl going to school is a, is a wanton woman who's just out there to land mm. some chin strapped, greasy haired dude. Like, it really breaks my heart that Pakistan doesn't have to be this way. Our culture doesn't have to be this way. You know, Sapa and I spoke about really difficult topics. Yet at the end of our conversation, I didn't feel powerless like I can't change anything. It's Sabah's unique voice and unique perspective as a Pakistani American, and that she's got such a supportive family, that's for sure. But it's also that she's not alone. She's not a lone voice. There are many women who want more than anything to live in a better version of Pakistan, where they can walk safely in public, where men engage with women as human beings with personalities, ambitions, dreams, desires, and where patriarchy doesn't get to parade around like culture or honor or respect or even religion. Thank you for listening to Her Kanjo Won't Smudge. I'm your host, Shauna. If you want to get in touch with us in rage or have a good cry or just tell us what you're thinking, look for our webpage online or find us on social media. Until next week. <laughs>